Okay, well, thank you very much for joining. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Casey Lam. Uh, a very warm welcome to Invest Hong Kong's webinar on uh, Hong Kong business perspective in trade, retail, and sourcing. My name is Casey Lam, and I'm head of the consulate and chamber engagement team at Invest Hong Kong. I will be your MC today, as well as one of the speakers in a later session. Today, we'll explore the opportunities that you can tap into from a base in Hong Kong. And most, as most of you will know, Hong Kong is an exciting cosmopolitan center for business as well as tourism. Hong Kong is famous as a shopping and eating paradise, and this is as true today as it has ever been. For the format of our webinar today, we'll have introductions and welcome remarks from distinguished guests, followed by three presentations by myself and two other colleagues uh, here at Invest Hong Kong, that will be followed by a panel discussion by three distinguished panelists before a final closing by a member of the um, Malaysian Chamber here. The whole webinar will be around one, minute, one hour and 30 minutes in, in, in total. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat box. You'll find them at the bottom of your screen. Our speakers will be monitoring the questions and will try to answer them in real time where they can, uh, also through the chat box. Those questions that can't be answered uh, through the chat box will follow up with you um, afterwards. So please be sure to leave us your contact details in chat box as well. The chat box is the <clears throat> sorry is only to the panelists, so um, your contact details will not be sh seen or shared with other participants. Uh, also, at the end, if you want a copy of the presentation, please leave us your contact details also at the chat uh, in the chat box uh, before the end of the of the session, and we'll be able to record that. Uh, to open our webinar today, I would like to invite our honourable guest, Mr. Yap Mei Sin, Consul General of Malaysia to Hong Kong and Macau, to deliver his introduction and welcome remarks. Consul General Yap arrived in Hong Kong in March 2019 to take up his assignment as Consul General of Malaysia to Hong Kong and Macau. Prior to coming to Hong Kong, Mr. Yap has served in various posts, most recently as Special Officer to the Secretary General, Director of the ASEAN Malaysia National Secretariat, Councillor at the Embassy of Malaysia in Kuwait, First Secretary at the Embassy of Malaysia in Manila in the Philippines, uh, and before that he was Political Officer, Middle East and North Africa Division, and also Political Officer of the Americas Division. Here in Hong Kong, he is Patron of both the Malaysian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong and Macau, as well as the Malaysian Association of Hong Kong. He is also advisory council member of the Glen Eagles Hospital here, as well as patron of the Hong Kong Malaysian Students Association. He is dean of the ASEAN Consular Corps in Hong Kong, as well as dean of the Asian Consular Corps in Hong Kong. That means um, uh, uh, Consul General Yap is the most senior diplomat in the ASEAN and Asian Consular Corps here. Mr. Yap, we're very honored to have you join us. Thank you very much for your time. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Casey. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for, jo for joining us today for the Hong Kong Business Perspective in Trade, Retail and Sourcing webinar, which the Consul General of Malaysia in Hong Kong is pleased to be supporting. It is my pleasure to be here to kick things off. And thank you to Maycham, Hong Kong and Macau, Invest Hong Kong, the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers and Matrix Hong Kong for jointly organizing this event. Today's objective is always relevant. Malaysia is a trading nation and trade is an artery of our economy. The government of Malaysia remains fully committed to developing an, an environment where our export sector can thrive and remain competitive and sustainable in the face of external challenges. Malaysia has continuously ranked among the 25 top trading nations in the world and is one of the world's top exporters in many sectors such as electrics and, and electronics, food ingredients, medical devices, palm oil, furniture, and oil and gas services. I'm happy to note that despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, Malaysia's trade for the first eight months of this year grew by 30% to 340 billion US dollars compared with the same period in 2020. Exports increased by 25% to 190 billion US dollars, and, and imports rose by 20% to 150 billion US dollars. 
Malaysia's ongoing trade promotion efforts have kept us on the map of importers, especially from Hong Kong and China. Hong Kong is and remains an important economic partner for us. Despite the headwinds of the past year, total Malaysia Hong Kong trade in 2020 of 25 billion US dollars registered little change from 2019. Reflecting our robust trade ties, Hong Kong was Malaysia's seventh largest trading partner in 2020. Last year, Malaysian exports in goods to Hong Kong totaled total 21.4 billion US dollars. And in, and, and, and in 2019, our export in goods to Hong Kong was valued at 6.1, sorry, at 16.1 billion US dollars. In both these years, Hong Kong was Malaysia's fourth largest export market in goods. These positive trends have continued into 2021. For example, from January to September this year, Malaysian export in goods to Hong Kong amounted to 13.4 billion US dollars. And this year, Hong Kong was and has remained among our top five export markets. Ladies and gentlemen, while we are encouraged by these figures, we continue to be, we continue to encounter challenges to our export competitiveness caused by global economic uncertainties across various fronts. In responding to these challenges, the Malaysian government, particularly the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, or MITI, and the Malaysia External Trade Development Corporation, or MATRADE, continue to work hard to enhance our global export competitiveness and strengthen Malaysia's position as a leading exporting nation. Towards this end, the Malaysian government launched the new National Trade Blueprint on 25th October 2021. This blueprint outlines a five-year development strategy from 2021 to 2025 to enhance Malaysia's export competitiveness, specifically in the exports of merchandise. It aims to position Malaysia as a dynamic and preeminent trading nation through sustainable export and development. The four objectives of the blueprint are to one, identify the challenges in enhancing trade competitiveness, two, benchmark against other countries with effective strategies and best practices in trade promotion, uh, three, formulate and implement action plans and programs for the government, industry, and the private sector to enhance trade competitiveness, and lastly, four, to enhance Malaysia's export competitiveness through an improved business ecosystem, the increase of export value and number of exporters, and the promotion of products where Malaysia has or should have competitiveness. The National Trade Blueprint complements other current policy and policies and master plans by converging objectives, aligning and consolidating initiatives, and bringing together various stakeholders to create a more conducive business ecosystem. Malaysia and Hong Kong enjoy strong trade relations and ASEAN and Hong Kong are important trading partners. We should recall that the free trade agreement and the investment agreement between ASEAN and Hong Kong entered into force in full on 12th February this year, providing a boon for our trade in goods and services. So the present is heartening and the future is very bright. Abundant opportunities lay for Malaysian exporters with the development of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, comprising Hong Kong and Macau, of course, as well as the nine municip municipalities in Guangdong. The total population in the GBA is almost 90 million, and collectively, the GBA represents a GDP of 1.7 trillion US dollars. And talking about regions and collective opportunities, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is expected to take effect in January next year. Our set comprising the 10 ASEAN member states, China, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea accounts for 30% of the global population. Its combined GDP is 25 trillion US dollars or 30% of the world's GDP, and it accounts for 10.7 trillion US dollars or 27% of global merchandise trade. Malaysia welcomes Hong Kong's interest in seeking accession to the RCEP. And when we eventually welcome Hong Kong to the fold, 
Malaysia Hong Kong trade will enjoy further market access, integrated supply chains, shared standards, and many other benefits. So, ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia Hong Kong opportunities are rich, be it in Malaysia, in Hong Kong, the GBA, or the wider RCEP. The business ecosystems are conducive, and the public and private sectors are willing and committed to improving them further. Today's webinar is testament to this, and I'm confident that Malaysia Hong Kong trade, business, and economic ties will continue to rise to more impressive heights. With that, I wish to reiterate my appreciation to all involved in organizing this event, and thank you, and I wish you a fruitful and productive afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Consul General. Um, the future is indeed bright. Um, we are <clears throat> very grateful for your support to our work here. Um, coming up next, we are very privileged to have the, also the support of the Malay Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers, or FMM. Uh, this, we hope, is the beginning of an exciting partnership between Invest Hong Kong, uh, the Ch Malaysian Chamber of Commerce here, and the FMM. I would like to welcome Mr. Hiroyuki Imizu, Council Member of the FMM and also Chairman of the FMM Export and International Business Committee to deliver his intro introductory remarks. In his professional capacity, Imizu-san is Deputy Managing Director of the Panasonic Management Malaysia. Imizu-san joins us from Malaysia. Thank you for your time, Imizu-san. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Keshi. Uh, once again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address uh, this opening remarks on behalf of IFMM. Uh, Mr. Yap Wei Sing, Consul General of Malaysia in Hong Kong. Mr. Lam Jin Tsun, Head of Consulate and Chamber Engagement Investment Hong Kong. Mr. Liao Zen Ping, Vice Chairman, the Ministry, sorry, the Malaysian Chamber of Commerce Hong Kong and Macau. Mrs. Nu Ezwani Ahama, Trade Commissioner, Matrade Hong Kong, esteemed speakers, distinguished guests, FMM members, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturer, FMM, I thank the Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, Hong Kong and Macau for the honor to co-organize today's webinar on exporting to Hong Kong, perspective on food and beverage, and fast moving consumer goods industry, along with the investment Hong Kong and Malaysia External Trade Development Corporation, Matrade Hong Kong, to virtual platform in conjunction with the Cosmopro Asia Digital Week the leading trade fair in Asia for the beauty and wellness industry scheduled from 16th to 8th, sorry, 8th to 16th November, 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, as a country that is highly dependent on the trade and the involvement trade, the involvement of Malaysia in FTA is quite important in pursuing national trade and investment agenda. FTAs play an important role, especially in attracting foreign direct investment, as well as increasing export through preferential market access. As some of you are aware, the 10 ASEAN member states of Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, and Malaysia, along with Hong Kong, China, have concluded the negotiation of the ASEAN Hong Kong China Free Trade Agreement, AHK FTA, in July 2017. And the AHK Hong Kong FTA enter into force for Malaysia in October 13th, 2019. In 2020, Malaysia's total trade with Hong Kong amounted to 19.76 billion USD, 
with export of 16.36 billion USD and imports of 3.40 billion USD. According to the Department of the Statistic Malaysia, export from Malaysia to Hong Kong from January to August 2021 increased by 12.3% to 11.39 billion USD compared with uh, 10.14 billion USD for the same period in 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, 2020 and 2021 have been a time of unprecedented challenges for Malaysian manufacturers as the economic disruptions resulting from the movement control orders introduced to contain the COVID-19 weighed heavily on our businesses. More than ever, manufacturer must hear the pressing call to go beyond the domestic borders, to seek opportunity in markets that possesses strong growth potential areas Sorry, <clears throat> being known, the region's uh, leading financial hub, coupled with the opportunity arises from the good Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau Bay area, which combine the expertise of more than 10 other 10 cities throughout the region to create a world class city cluster. Hong Kong offers a highly transparent and robust regulatory regime for financial services industries, such as banking, securities, and futures, insurance, and retirement schemes. As such, today's event is therefore organized with the aim to assist the participant to, be, to better understanding and the requirement and the opportunity in food and beverage and fast moving consumer goods sectors and to provide ideas on how best to optimize on this knowledge to penetrate the market. Speakers will provide update on the general business environment and experiences sharing, sharing in doing business in Hong Kong. Participants are strongly encouraged to take full advantage of the Q&A session to share your views and raise your queries, as well as seek clarification from these speakers on any concerns you may have. We hope that you will bring back valuable knowledge that will assist you access the Hong Kong market, both in terms of the trade and investment. Thank you for your participation and attention. I wish you get a productive webinar. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mizu-san. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we can kick off. Uh, introducing the next session is easy. It's me. I am Casey Lam. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm head of the consulate and uh, chamber engagement team at Invest Hong Kong. Um, the chamber and uh, the consulate and chamber engagement team provides ongoing support to uh, foreign businesses in Hong Kong through an ongoing relationship building process with uh, chambers and consulates. Uh, today, I'm going to give a brief overview and introduction to the general business environment and benefits of doing business in Hong Kong and through Hong Kong. Um, so let me just start by sharing my screen, which is here. Okay. Uh, I hope everybody can see. Please let me know if you don't. Um, the title is A Window of Opportunity into Asia's Key Markets. So that's always uh, with the um, focus on Hong Kong and through Hong Kong. Um, right. Let's see. Okay, it works. Okay, <clears throat> the presentation will contain four parts. The first part is on Hong Kong's um, enduring advantages. Hong Kong has changed somewhat 
uh, since your last visit, but we have many advantages that are still enduring. Uh, I'll give a brief update on the vibrant business environment here in Hong Kong and the results of some surveys we've done recently. I'll talk about the opportunities that the, the Greater Bay Area um, will offer. Uh, Consul General Yap mentioned this, and this is indeed probably the biggest opportunity um, of our generation. Um, and I'll also touch on the Belt and Road Initiative. And finally, I'll give an introduction on Invest Hong Kong, the role that we have and how we can help you going forward. First of all, the Hong Kong advantages. <clears throat> Hong Kong um, has always thrived on itself being a, an international business hub. We're right at the heart of Asia, uh, south of China, uh, north of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, we have benefited from the traditional east-west trade in the past. Uh, going forward, um, the um, implementation <clears throat> coming into force of RCEP, and uh, the increasing trade between mainland China and Southeast Asia, we will increasingly be in the middle of that north-south trading route. So again, we're finding ourselves in a fortunate, fortunate position. Hong Kong is part of China, and therefore we uh, function under the one country, two systems uh, system. <clears throat> Hong Kong um, enjoys the benefits of being in China, but also outside China. Uh, we have everything uh, that is, um, we have a high level of autonomy uh, in Hong Kong. We have a high degree of economic freedom. We have a common law system that's familiar to lawyers from Malaysia. We have an independent judiciary and that independence is fiercely protected by the people of Hong Kong and by the government of Hong Kong. We have a robust financial system as evidenced by um, record levels of IPOs coming into Hong Kong. There is a pipeline of uh, IPOs that are stuck in, in the mainland waiting, queuing up to, to come to Hong Kong, but we are still, I think, ranking number three in the world so far this year. Uh, the taxation system is highly competitive and very simple. We only tax profits and only profits generated within Hong Kong at that. So basically, it's a territorial tax system. A Hong Kong company that generates tax out, uh, profits outside Hong Kong th through activities outside Hong Kong, those activities are not taxed. Um, we now have a two-tier system for taxation. The first um, $2 million tier, so from no tax, so zero profit to $2 million profit Hong Kong, um, which is around 1 million ringgit, roughly, uh, it's taxed at half the standard rate, which is 8.25% half rate. The full rate comes in after, on the tranche above the $2 million. So that's at 165 and even then that's quite low. There is no VAT tax, there is no GST, there is no sales tax. So <clears throat> essentially a company that's trading in Hong Kong, uh, if you accumulate a loss in any given year, the loss can actually be carried forward to offset future income and you'll only be taxed when you eventually get to a net positive position. And then you only be taxed at the rate of 8.25 for the first 2 million and then 16.5 beyond that. There is no capital gains tax. So if you buy a property in Hong Kong, for example, and you sell it at a profit, um, there is no, prof no uh, tax on that capital gains. There is no withholding tax uh, on, uh, on investments. Um, interestingly, some of you may not know, in Hong Kong to um, start a company is actually incredibly easy and incredibly efficient. Uh, all you need is a minimum of one director and one shareholder. Um, the two can be the same person, and that person does not need to be a Hong Kong resident. Uh, you don't need a high level of, uh, of capital. Um, the minimum, uh, theoretically, is $1, although most people register $10,000 as registered capital to make themselves more credible. Uh, and um, <clears throat> that person can actually start a company within seven to 10 days. Uh, if you're really in a hurry, you can actually buy a company off the shelf and then change those directors, uh, the director or shareholder to your own name and you have a company that's off the shelf and ready to go. Um, and the best thing about doing uh, business in Hong Kong and being a shareholder in that, in that company is if you paid your profits tax, beyond your profits tax, um, after you've paid that tax, you can actually pay yourself in dividends as a shareholder. 
And in Hong Kong, there is no tax on share, um, dividends payments. So instead of paying yourself a salary, you pay yourself a dividend, and then that dividend is entirely yours. And on repatriation outside Hong Kong, there is no withholding tax on that either. There is no state duty, there's no global taxation, and uh, there is no wine duty either. <clears throat> the business environment in Hong Kong is very vibrant. We do an annual survey every year. The last one we did showed a record high number of um, companies with a headquarter which is outside Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong being a either local office, regional office, or a regional headquarter. And the number of regional headquarters also reached a record high. The major sources of investment into Hong Kong come from mainland China. China is a very, very large investor into Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong is a gateway for going into China as well as out of China. Um, its nationalization of companies happens very, very well here. Uh, but other <clears throat> economies that are finding Hong Kong useful for their investments and expansion include Japan, US, UK, and Singapore. Singapore being interesting because Hong Kong does have benefits that Singapore does not have, and Singapore can, Singaporean companies do invest in Hong Kong, through Hong Kong, actually. I'll skip over this one. I'll share these slides, by the way. So do leave your contact details in the chat box uh, if you want a copy of these slides and those of my colleagues. Uh, we'd be more than happy to, to share them with you. Um, you can read them at your leisure, but basically we have a very firm and um, ongoing um, benefits of, of operating in Hong Kong through free, free flow of, of people, information, capital, and, um, and uh, our location uh, is, 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 you cannot compete. Yeah. Um, lines of, major lines of business in Hong Kong include import export to traditional things, financial services, professional services, and of course, transportation, logistics, um, and so on. Uh, Hong Kong's startup and fintech ecosystem is thriving. We have a record number of startups in Hong Kong. Uh, we had fintech week last week, a physical event actually. Uh, we didn't have a physical event last year, but this uh, this year we had a physical event, and uh, this edition was very very exciting. The attendance was very very high, and um, the number of people employed in those startups uh, is also at a record high. Um, the opportunities arise from the Greater Bay. Consul General Yap mentioned this, and uh, I'll also outline it through this map. Hong Kong is this little bit here, which you can see. Um, and these nine cities outside Hong Kong uh, are the nine cities in the so-called, um, in the GBA, and they are in, in Guangdong province. Uh, so the GBA, um, is actually nine cities in the uh, uh, Guangdong province, plus the two special administrative regions of Macau and Hong Kong. So each city has a specialization. Uh, Shenzhen, for example, uh, specializes in uh, innovation technology. It's home to Huawei, it's home to DJI. Uh, you have uh, Guangzhou here, which is the gateway city. Uh, it's the provincial capital. You have um, Macau, which is a tourism and entertainment center. Uh, you have the manufacturing bases in Foshan and Zhongshan and so on. So whatever your area of activity, there is actually a, a very significant resource in mainland China to support and back that activity. Also mentioned was the population of um, this very small area. After all, it's only 56,000 kilometers, but it has, um, <clears throat> and the last survey, 86 million um, population. And so uh, it's a population comparable to that of Germany, and it has a, product, a GDP of $1.6 trillion. Uh, it's as much a sourcing market as a uh, as much as a, a destination um, consumer market. And my two colleagues will touch on that um, in, in their presentations. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative, I'm sure everybody has heard of, I'll touch on here. Uh, essentially, Hong Kong is a service center for uh, companies looking to tap into the opportunities of the Belt and Road. We have an increasing capability of serving companies who have ambitions to um, develop um, opportunities along the Belt and Road. Uh, they include uh, financial services, um, 
bonds and so on, um, green financing, uh, built, built, uh, roads and bridges that are built um, using green financing is, is, a, is a hot topic at the moment. R&D, uh, the Hong Kong government is funding a lot of R&D um, to help develop that market. Uh, legal and arbitration, of course, you know, as we go into, into any um, commercial uh, agreement, there is inevitably some um, disagreement that may happen along the way. Uh, if there is a, um, a disagreement uh, in, in, in a contract somewhere and the contract uh, says, you know, uh, the, the, the contract is to be ruled or arbitrated in Hong Kong, then the Hong Kong Arbitration Center is an ex excellent and efficient way of, of, uh, of resolving those disputes, uh, much better than to going uh, to a court of law. And um, decisions that are made uh, at those arbitration centers can be enforced in any of the signatory uh, countries of the New York Convention. And of course, Hong Kong is a great place to find partners for JVs to explore the opportunities along the Belt and Road. Um, come back here. Sorry. Okay. Um, Consul General Yap also mentioned RCEP. This is a very exciting initiative by the mainland of China. It groups uh, around one third of the world's GDP, around one third of the world's population. Uh, the trade within RCEP can only increase. Uh, with the facilitation of trade within the bloc. The 15 signatories, um, at least at the beginning, are those listed on the right. Uh, Hong Kong aspires to join that very soon, and we hope we'll be a member, a full-fledged member of RCEP very soon. We have the, uh, the support of central government in Beijing for that. Uh, RCEP will um, aim to eliminate at least 92% uh, tariff on uh, at least 90% of the of the goods and that's a very, very significant uh, amount of, of trade and um, <clears throat> through that we hope to achieve an annual um, trade figure of in excess of 200 billion US dollars. Um, some very exciting times for exporters in the region including Malaysian exporters. Hong Kong does have a role in that. And how does Invest Hong Kong help? Well, Invest Hong Kong, a very quick word about ourselves. We are a Hong Kong government department. We uh, fall under the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development. So we promote inward investment from overseas into Hong Kong. Um, we are organized by industry sectors and clusters. Broadly, they are around a cluster in technology and innovation. Uh, another sector and cluster around the financial services and professional services, an area that Hong Kong is particularly strong at, and a third cluster around lifestyle and creative industries. Today, we'll have my, uh, we have two of my colleagues from two of those teams, consumer products and tourism hospitality, um, talk about their sectors to you and the opportunities that exist. We also have a network of 31 offices around the world. Um, they, including three in ASEAN, uh, Bangkok, um, Singapore, and Jakarta. Um, our markets in uh, Malaysia are looked after by our colleagues in Jakarta, but you're more than welcome to reach out to us directly. We have um, teams that will be able to serve you directly and connect you with their networks here in Hong Kong. Um, how we help companies um, set up and grow well, we help them right from the beginning. We hope the companies come, in Hong, come to Hong Kong for the right reasons. If you have a plan to expand outside of Malaysia, um, initially perhaps through um, trading, selling, uh, that's always the first step. You find traction for your products or services. You think, hey, that's, that's, it's starting to pick up. Maybe um, setting up a red presence in Hong Kong could be a, a way to support that growth. And so what we try to do is we try to give in, information to investors uh, right at the beginning of their thinking process and their planning process. Hopefully it will help you fill the boxes in your Excel sheets as you start to do business plans and so on. And as you start to make the move into um, exploring that market further, when the borders open, of course, you can come and we'll set up uh, visits for you, uh, organize um, meetings for, uh, for you with uh, relevant stakeholders and, uh, and industry contacts. In the meantime, before you travel, we'd be more than happy to start that conversation with you. The earlier, the better. If you have questions, um, do let us know. 
Uh, there will always be unknowns, but we're trying to reduce the number of unknowns as much as possible before you actually start to make that move. Uh, when you decide to come over to the, the setup in, 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 in earnest, uh, we will be on hand to give you that hand-holding uh, through that process. We'll be able to connect you with the right service providers. We'll connect you with people who are able to advise you on which areas of Hong Kong would be best to put up your shop or your warehouse or your office or where to put your, uh, your staff if you have uh, expats coming over. Um, and we'll also support you with the launch. The launch itself, um, we can support you through some publicity and media. We have a very active social media network now, uh, and uh, we work through the government, the Hong Kong official government information services department network. And uh, through that, we release uh, news of your installation in Hong Kong through that. And after you set up in Hong Kong, there is an ongoing care that we give to you through your aftercare program, the so-called business retention and expansion. And so we want to not only attract, but also retain and help you expand in Hong Kong. Um, that concludes my part. Uh, it's only the beginning of this conversation. You have my contact details here. Um, please do take a screenshot of this um, or just zap it using, using your phone. Um, do follow us on, on, uh, on LinkedIn and do get in touch. Um, I will refer you definitely to my colleagues in, in the sectors that are relevant to you. And indeed, if you have friends who are not in the FMCG or the food and FMB trading business, but in other, other sectors, we have teams for those as well. So um, that concludes my part. Um, the next session will be um, my colleague, Cindy. My colleague, Cindy, is head of the, um, let me see, uh, let me unshare. Okay, you're here. Okay, uh, my colleague Cindy, <clears throat> uh, who is waving at us, is head of the tourism and hospitality team at Invest Hong Kong. She joined Invest Hong Kong in September 2004 and was promoted to head of tourism and hospitality in 2015. Her team assists companies from the food services sector, food and beverage trading, food tech, which is increasingly important, travel and mice as well as wellness, beauty industries globally. And uh, we help them land here in our city, her home city of Hong Kong. Thank you, Cindy, over to you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Um, thank you, Casey. Uh, let me start with my slide. First of all, I will talk about um, the F&B trends in Hong Kong because nowadays we, we can't travel. You cannot travel to Hong Kong. We cannot travel to Malaysia to try your food products. So we give you, you know, an overview of uh, the trends and the market scene in Hong Kong. And then my colleague, Angelica, will talk about uh, the retail and consumer side. Um, just a recap uh, for the Hong Kong market, um, we have 7.5 million population a lot of hungry um, mouth to feed. And uh, in the GBA area, as uh, Case just mentioned, we have 86 million population. Uh, in Hong Kong, we have 3.9 million labor force in Hong Kong, the working uh, people here. Um, for Hong Kong, we have over 16,000 restaurants in Hong Kong. That means one restaurant, uh, for every 400 people. There's a huge demand of, of food uh, ingredients for Hong Kong. We have 69 Michelin star restaurants here and also 11 out of 50 best restaurants in Asia. Huge demand from um, the uh, B2B and also B2C side. A few slides about your know, update about Hong Kong. I'm sure, you know, in Malaysia and also all over the world, um, the, uh, the COVID actually uh, accelerated uh, a lot of the digital ecosystem. Nowadays in Hong Kong, of course, the uh, takeaway delivery is very popular and online delivery becomes a very important uh, income stream um, for restaurants. And uh, more and more companies are focusing on collaboration of meal delivery. So if you are a restaurant owner or if you are a food and beverage producer trading company for, for this, because of the trend. So you may need to um, reserve more budget, you know, in terms of spending on the e-commerce and also on the online, you know, delivery that's expense and ratio. For the retail data, well, as I, I, I 
a little bit of good news is uh, finally, because of COVID, actually um, the rent dropped to a new low for Hong Kong. Uh, for the street level shops, it dropped by half. And for the shopping malls, it dropped close to 40% in terms of the rental. Uh, but we can see that actually it start to be more stable in the last quarter. Some of our clients are actually, you know, um, uh, rebalancing the portfolio, some of the restaurant people, they may not be opening in the traditional um, CBD areas, but focusing more on the neighborhood area. Like for example, if you are familiar with Hong Kong, like for example, TKO, the Cheng Guang O, or even Chung Wan, the TW Chung Wan area, more the neighborhood, the local people, they will be uh, focusing on. A lot of focus on takeaway business, uh, for takeaway business, actually, a lot of the restaurants, they have to modify an easier menu items for the food delivery. But uh, because Hong Kong people, we are very sophisticated, you know, gourmet eater, so cannot compromise on food quality. So easy for takeaway, but also with high uh, quality of food. And we can see that more cloud kitchen are opening in Hong Kong. Uh, for companies or for restaurants, when you first come to Hong Kong, of course, renting a, a restaurant is an option, but also some of the companies, they may rent uh, a space in a shared kitchen, in a cloud kitchen, which can minimize the production cost, uh, the rental cost, and the investment. Because most of the time, the cloud kitchen, actually, they have a setup. You are ready to move in, and then the license is also being taken care of already. Small is the new big nowadays. We can see that especially for takeaway business, the size can be as small as uh, 200 to 300 square feet to serve mainly the locals. And we can see a lot of entrepreneurs or even chef owners are taking the chance of lower rent nowadays to test the new concept and uh, for the new menus. And also we can see uh, a lot of local restaurant groups are looking into bringing in more franchise into Hong Kong. So if you are the franchise owner from Malaysia, welcome to contact us. We may be able to connect you with the right franchisee in Hong Kong to start your operation in this side. Okay. Okay, for the um, the market overview for food, actually in Hong Kong, we don't produce a lot of food. So we have to import 95% of uh, the food and beverage ingredients into Hong Kong. And you can see the red part, actually over 75% of the items are from ingredients, like for example, meat, vegetables, especially fruits. I'm sure, you know, Malaysia, you have plenty, especially your very famous durian is very popular in Hong Kong. And I just heard from our speaker later, Stephen, that actually during you got two seasons, at least two seasons, yeah, he told me uh, in, in, in Malaysia. So we have the chance to have more durians in Hong Kong nowadays. And also um, uh, for the ingredients, we also have a few portion from seafood and also dairy products and eggs. There are different models to enter Hong Kong. For Invest Hong Kong, of course, we love to guide you through the setup process. But for companies from Malaysia, of course, the first thing you need to know is whether there is potential for your products in Asia, in, in Hong Kong, in China, or in Macau. So the first thing you may need to attend a trade fair, which uh, as you know, we'll talk about you know, that later, or join some of the trade fairs you know, in Hong Kong to know the industry people, uh, to test our recipe, let um, the local people to try your products in the trade fairs. The next step you may look into, uh, you can sell through distributors or importers or franchisee, or some of the company, they will set up their own marketing office. In Hong Kong, marketing office can be just one person, two person to liaise with like the retail channels um, to do the branding and marketing. And on the other side, you can also sell online directly, setting up of your own website and your own retail channels. All year round, uh, we have different dining events and exhibitions in Hong Kong. And for Hong Kong, actually, our fiscal fairs are back to normal. So uh, in August, we already have our food 
Food Expo, uh, we already have our harvest uh, in September, uh, restaurant and bar, natural and organic Asia, and then some of the Malaysian companies actually participated already. And uh, in the coming months, uh, next year, uh, of course, we will have the Asia Fruit Logistica in September and also other trade fairs ongoing. If you want to know more, feel free to contact us in Hong Kong or contact you know, our counterparts in Malaysia as well. You may ask, you know, when you talk about, you know, Hong Kong is so straightforward and simple to start, to start a business, how simple for food and beverage trading company to set up in Hong Kong. Actually, all you need to do is to register as a food importer or a food distributor. Uh, you can see, you know, from this slide, we'll share with you later if you have interest. Uh, you can have a register with a business address, the contact details and then pay a fee of 195 Hong Kong dollar, which will be better for three years already. But of course, for Hong Kong, the importation, there's no specific duty on most of the food items, but for um, liquor, you need to pay 100% uh, uh, duty if you are import, uh, exporting to Hong Kong uh, for alcoholic beverage with over 30% of alcoholic content. If you are um, exporting rice, egg, meat, ice cream, milk, or spirit to Hong Kong, you need to get a license from different uh, Hong Kong departments. Uh, we can give you advice on that and guide you through this process. If not, you are sending in like some you know, packaged food, then it can be very straightforward to start your business. It can be done in a few days in terms of the registration. Casey talked about a little bit about the GBA area already. I don't think I need to go into very details uh, of every uh, city, uh, but I want to share with you, especially on the roles of, of the role of Hong Kong company, especially for you know, the F&B business. One thing is about you know, using a Hong Kong company uh, to hold a Chinese company. Actually, there will be a special benefit. Uh, like the withholding task can be down to 5% instead of 10%. That is the monetary benefit for a Hong Kong company. And also, if you are a SME company, small to medium-sized company, it's very important to have a Hong Kong company to act as a risk manager for you to enter China, because China is a very big market. And then Hong Kong can be a very good test bed and then to test out your recipe and your concept in Hong Kong, and then go into GBA, into China next step. Because Hong Kong, actually, we have very similar eating habit, culture, and also the language, the local dialect of Cantonese, you know, within the Gutta Bay area. In terms of marketing, Hong Kong also has a free flow of information. Um, you can make use of a lot of professional agencies and marketing channels in Hong Kong to understand the China market, which is very different you know, uh, from Hong Kong and the rest of the world. So Hong Kong can act as a marketing hub um, for your company to understand the Chinese consumers. Like for example, yesterday yeah, is a single day, you know, why we are so crazy about single day? You know, what is the turnover? What is popular? What's the top 10, you know, uh, selling items? Hong Kong will be a perfect place for you to understand the trend of the market. Lastly, it's about the partnership. Um, Hong Kong, we have, of course, world-class financial platform. You can find a lot of fundings from different banks, from Hong Kong Stock Exchange for the listing, but we have a plenty of partners to work with you. And I, uh, for Invest Hong Kong, we have different uh, strategic partners to work with, like logistic companies, or you know, cargo companies, or professional service companies, accountant firm, legal firms, we can, we can connect you with different strategic partners so that you can expand your business in Hong Kong and into China, next step. So that's briefly, you know, I set a scene, you know, for um, you understand about the Hong Kong and then my colleague Angelica will continue to talk to you about the retail side. Uh, we look forward, you know, for more Malaysian products to come into Hong Kong. And I'm sure uh, Stephen uh, later in the panel discussion session will share with you more of his uh, experience in helping, you know, or importing Malaysian products. Okay, so I hand over to Angelica now.
Okay, I was due to actually do a quick introduction of, uh, of uh, Angelica. Let me just put that through. Angelica is head of our consumer products team at Ives Hong Kong. Um, her current focus is on facilitating investments from companies in retail or sourcing of toys, cosmetics, jewelry, home furnishings, fashion, electronic appliances, and most recently extending to retail technology. Uh, over to you, uh, Angelica. Okay, hey, thank you, everyone. Uh, just before we continue, I'd like to share with everyone that Casey is a big fan of uh, Malaysian durians. So uh, uh, anyone, if you're a durian seller in Malaysia, you got one big customer already in Hong Kong waiting for you to come. Okay, so um, uh, today for our slides, we'll be talking about the non-food sector. So first of the question is, during COVID, what happened to Hong Kong retail sales in Hong Kong? So uh, if you look at the gray bars, uh, you can see the winner has been supermarket. So if you are a supplier to a supermarket goods, uh, it has been doing supremely well uh, during COVID. And then if we focus on the red bars, uh, the far uh, bars on the right uh, <clears throat> in medicine, cosmetics, cosmetics in dis uh, department stores and personal care, those three bars add up to 5 billion US dollars in retail sales. So even in Hong Kong 2020, without any tourist numbers, uh, our retail has been uh, holding up. And then uh, in the cosmetic sector, which is a really big area for Hong Kong because we don't have animal testing and we don't need uh, a special regulations and we also uh, allow labeling such as um, organic product or eco -surf. You can see from the uh, bar on the left, uh, that is Asia Pacific. And Asia Pacific is leading the growth in both uh, market size and also annual growth number. And the orange part you can see is skincare. So skincare is the big winner in uh, Asia Pacific. And also we're uh, seeing from Euro, Euro Monitor statistics that everyone is uh, heavily investing into digital strategy, working with platforms, uh, working with social media, working with KO and influencers. Uh, so definitely Hong Kong is a great test bed uh, for cosmetics market, both for the Hong Kong market and also for uh, cross border into the mainland. So furthering on the cosmetic uh, segment, uh, this is also again from Euromonitor. They identified a couple of trends, uh, the trends that you see in the blue boxes. And I'd like to bring your attention to two of them. One is Rethink Wellness, uh, which is clean formulations, back to basics, uh, athleisure, you know, sports related items, and also the point on uh, sustainable living, uh, which means recycling and circular business models. So if we see the photo, we're looking at um, a pump station. So you can bring your own bottle um, and uh, basically fill up and then you are charged by weight. Uh, this photo is taken by uh, Slowwood in Central Market. So when we're talking about Central Market, uh, it's uh, for those of you who have visited Hong Kong, it's right in the middle of Central and we've been waiting it for quite a long time. And uh, there are about 100 little stores in Central Market. Uh, each of them is about 200, uh, 20, 200 square feet. That's 20 square meters. Uh, and you can take up pop-up spaces or take up a short-term lease to test the market in Hong Kong. Um, and so these are new business models. And then um, for Abu Thai, uh, this is a, a trend of having country or regionally specific multi-brand stores. So in Abu Thai, they're actually selling things like frozen chicken, potato chips, cosmetics, accessories, packaged food, uh, fruit, uh, face masks. So you, this photo is taken by the Abu Thai just five minutes from our office. And at any time of the day, it's super busy. So if you are a uh, conglomerate in Malaysia or you have some friends in non-competing industries, Think about coming into Hong Kong, sharing the cost of a retail outlet and going multi-brand. And the stores don't need to be big, as you can see from this one is about 10 to 20 square meters. And already you are having a lot of good traffic. 
Another brand from uh, Southeast Asia that I want to mention is Luvenis, which is doing really well in Singapore. So this company has uh, decided to focus on the Southeast Asian community in Hong Kong. Um, and I think that's a market that Cindy, mm -hmm. you know, your clients also focus on. And uh, if we're just talking about the overseas domestic helper market in Hong Kong, it's 300,000. 300,000 uh, mainly from Philippines or Indonesia, but they have strong spending power. And, um, uh, and when they save up, they do like to buy products like gold or uh, and the Indonesian community, they're going for uh, halal products, skincare. So uh, it's a big market here. And then of course, we have to mention this uh, top glove for Malaysia, uh, considering doing a dual primary listing uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, we're in contact with the Hong Kong uh, Stock uh, Exchange. So if there's uh, something you want to talk to us about listing in Hong Kong, uh, we can arrange a meeting for you to go through the step-by-steps on eligibility, on preparation, and things like that. So my colleagues were talking about uh, entry models. Um, one of them is the showroom and sales and marketing. Uh, later on on the panel, just after our presentation, we're going to have uh, Calvin, who's uh, actually from Penang, and he will be talking about um, sourcing, maybe sourcing a bit of furniture from Malaysia. So if you want to sell to companies based in Hong Kong, definitely you have got to listen to a sharing coming. And uh, showrooms are not expensive. They can be an industrial site. Uh, they can be big, can be small, can you have one person, 10 people, things like that. And then why set up in Hong Kong if you're in e-commerce? Uh, Casey mentioned we do retail and sourcing, but e-commerce is fast becoming a very important trend, both for food and uh, for non-food items. If you look at the blue box, um, we're talking about 2000 US plus per customer per year, uh, which personally I think is an understatement because I certainly buy a lot more than that. Um, but it's one of the highest basket size, right? You buy a lot more than that, right? Yeah, so easily, yeah. So um, uh, we both buy from uh, Hong Kong based uh, platforms and also cross border. Uh, to reiterate again, we have uh, we don't have import duties for the majority of products coming in. Uh, so Hong Kong's a great place if you want to be setting up your warehouse, if you want to be setting up your digital marketing team. And of course, uh, we always talk about uh, e-commerce in the mainland. And by having a warehouse in Hong Kong, you can be shipping cross-border e-commerce direct to the consumer in the mainland and paying a reduced uh, entry tax onto the mainland. Okay. So we're here to show you our latest publication, a total of four books. Uh, it has a lot of information. I know you might not be able to see it, but it's full of content. And on the last pages, we talk about uh, market entry models, all the latest statistics, how to do it step by step, and of course, content uh, uh, information. So please scan uh, and fill in a form to download all these four booklets for free, free of charge. And then please contact us and have a chat with us after you take a look. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Angelica. Wow, very, very rich in content. Um, I think it's quite... Are we there? Yeah. Oh, where are we? Okay, so um, yeah, very rich in content. Um, as I said, if you want a copy of those um, of those presentations, uh, please do get in touch through um, a, the chat, bo uh, chat box, put your, your, your uh, email in there, and uh, we'd be happy to, to get in touch with you through that. Um, also, if you could do us the favor of putting in your name and company name as well, that would really help us understand who we're talking to and uh, that will also help us start that conversation. So uh, please, if I didn't ask, I forgot to ask this before, um, if you have already put in your, your, your um, email, please enter it again with your name and your company name as well as your, your uh, email address, that'll be really cool. Um, the next session, uh, we have a panel discussion now on export opportunities for Malaysian exporters to and via Hong Kong. Uh, let me repeat this again, to and via Hong Kong. 
Uh, Hong Kong itself is a market, a viable market. We have 7.5 million people and the spending power in Hong Kong is considerable. Uh, but via Hong Kong means, uh, by that I mean the GBA with 86 million, as we said earlier, is a huge, huge market. So, you know, settling down in Hong Kong first and then from here looking uh, across the border into, into mainland China and GBA, uh, you get a much closer view and much better understanding. In the panel, we are delighted to welcome three distinguished panelists. Um, I have um, Ms. Noor Ezwani Ahmad from the Trade Section of the Consulate General of Malaysia in Hong Kong. Ezwani is the Malaysian Trade Commissioner in Hong Kong, overseeing the bilateral trade and investment relations, and also the promotion of Malaysian products and services in Hong Kong and Macau. Um, next, we have Mr. Stephen Young, uh, Group Managing Director of Grace Cup Group. Grace Cup Group was established in Hong Kong in 2002, promoting and selling uh, healthy organic fruits and vegetables in Hong Kong and China. Uh, Malaysia is one of their major sources from where they uh, import their various food stuff and ingredients. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Calvin, Calvin Tay, a General Manager of East and Southeast Asia for W Labels in Hong Kong. Um, Kelvin is a seasoned and strategically minded professional in the home and living industry uh, with extensive in experience in Asia on sourcing, strategy formulation, product quality and international supply chain management as well as startup operations. He has the latest and most up-to-date information and experience on the European and US home and living retail market trends their tastes and preferences in terms of furniture, tableware, and home furnishing. Over to you. Hey, thank you, Casey, for the introduction. All right, so thank you, Calvin and Stephen, for, for joining us today at the panel discussion on export opportunities in, for FMB and FMCG markets. Okay, um, so I, I guess I'll go straight to the questions, right? So I'll start with Stephen. Okay, Stephen. Um, but well, before anything, I just want to say that I call Stephen an honorary Malaysian because he's a great supporter and promoter of Malaysian products here in Hong thank Kong. You. And we thank you for bringing in Malaysian products here to Hong Kong. And also, um, basically, you are selling a lot of uh, Malaysian products. I think 80% yeah. of, your, of your imports are Mal from Malaysia. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, can you, you know, what started the interest? of bringing in Malaysian products? Actually, we start with a uh, periscope from Camera Highland, which is uh, 20 years ago. But uh, later, we found that there's uh, so many um, heritage product food. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, Malaysia is consists of uh, Malay, Indian, and Chinese. Mm -hmm. So um, actually, the, they speak their own language. They are not uh, English, maybe their common language, but they speak their own language, which means they, they protect, the, uh, inherit their many food products so so that uh, we can easily to find Hakka, Chiu Zhao, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what you call the, the Hokkien, mm -hmm. Guangdong, Hainan, and you can find Nyonya food. You can also find the, like the Indian food, like a Mamat store, mm -hmm. and then you can find the, the North Indian, like a, a Waki Paratha. Yes. South India is a Waki Malaba. Chai, yeah, chai. And of course, there's <laughs> many Nyonya food. Yeah. So, uh, Actually, Malaysia, I would consider it's like a, a, a food country. It's a, so they have their uniqueness of their uh, own food to preserve. Mm -hmm. Where you find your neighboring country that more or less they are more localized. Yes, yes. Yeah, so you're not easy to find that kind of product. Mm -hmm. So Malaysia is our major uh, sourcing country that we can bring the food to Hong Kong. Right. Yeah. Okay, and, see, I told you he's honorary Malaysian, he knows more about Malaysian food than us. <laughs> All right, out of, I mean, in your view as a FMB distributor here in Hong Kong, um, how has the Malaysian products performed in Hong Kong and what are the products that are in demand now? Um, actually, that uh, I found that uh, although there's uh, so many products in from Malaysia, but that I see there's uh, still a lot of room that the Malaysian company can come to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, the only uh, the advantage is that uh, Malaysia is a uh, many uh, company have their HALA mm -hmm. or HACCP, mm -hmm. which HALA can consider same as uh, or more about the HACCP. Yes. So that it is kind of an uh, advantage. Yeah. 
But uh, there's another room that the Malaysian company need to improve is the, the what they call is about the packaging. Right. And also that uh, there's an advantage of Malaysia is uh, they have uh, not a high cost production mm -hmm. and also surrounded by sea. So right. you can see so many seafood come to from Malaysia from Sapa. Yes. Every day maybe by ship, by yes. air come to come from Sapa. But there's also doing quite well like a uh, gawang. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then like a uh, uh, my curry instant noodle. Yes. But the other product we see that there is a, a huge uh, room to play for Malaysian uh, food catering business. Right. Yeah. So Steven also is also is is one of our durian distributor here in Hong yeah. Kong. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I believe the uh, one of the biggest market for durian uh, Malaysian durian is Hong Kong. Is the biggest importer. So. What do you think? I mean, you are technically one of the key people to import durian in Hong Kong. So how do you find it so far? Actually, the, the, the response. Well, we started this durian business 12 years ago, mm -hmm. which is the first company to introduce durian to Hong Kong market. So we found that uh, besides, apart from the Thailand uh, durian, so there's uh, more room to pay for uh, Malaysia because Malaysia is a uh, harvest from the tree, mm -hmm. written from the tree, yes. where the, the other country is a uh, they just maybe cut in the 50% harvest or 60% harvest. Right, right. So it's not less uh, 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 tasty. Right. So Malaysia is uh, actually on the top, on the top of the list. So we found that uh, every year there's uh, more room to grow for to rent product. Right. Yeah. So we we were just talking before the session that we are planning to do a, a durian tram party. Yeah? So yeah, yeah, let's make yeah. sure that they will have that will happen. <laughs> okay, then we'll move on to, to Kelvin. So okay, you're from um, W Labels Hong Kong. Uh, which is a, a sourcing office for West Wing Germany. So can you uh, explain more on, on West Wing Germany core business and W Labels Hong Kong core activities? Mm, thank you. Thanks for having me today. Uh, so West Wing, we are a e-commerce company We're in the market for about 10 years, uh, HQ in Munich, Germany. So a pure e-commerce company sells in 11 countries in Europe. And we came to Hong Kong about two years ago. Uh, we established a sourcing office in Hong Kong as our sourcing uh, hub in Asia. And then mainly we are sourcing for products like furniture, lighting, tableware, uh, textiles. And then that's also our core products that we sell in uh, Europe as well. I see, right. So out of the many countries that West Wing can choose, right? So why, why do you choose uh, to have a sourcing office in, in Hong Kong? Hmm. Great questions. So uh, we choose Hong Kong core product is because the integrations with our HQ. Mm -hmm. We are an e-commerce company and we need to have a very transparent uh, data integrations as well as information share. Mm -hmm. So by connecting uh, with our HQ through Hong Kong, that allow us to have the real time uh, selling data and then also allow us to react quite fast. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, as a logistic hub in uh, Asia, Hong Kong give us the advantage to ship mm -hmm. worldwide globally to our HQ without any much of the challenges. And it also is a key main gate for us to go to mainland China mm -hmm. easily. Uh, we can travel by high speed train to uh, Guangdong very easily from Kowloon. And then we also can fly, for example, to Malaysia, to Moa, to KL, a few hours flight. Yes. We can do that. Mm -hmm. So for us, Hong Kong is very strategic. Okay, so usually what are the main products sourced by a sourcing office such as your company? Mm. The, the main, the main, those priority products that you source for, mm. for instance? For instance, that our priority product right now are furniture, right. and then followed by lighting, and then uh, tableware deco, and then also textile and rust. And these are the core products that usually we source. Um, we don't focus a lot of uh, electronics or appliances, right. uh, but more on home and day. All right. So I, I believe you know about the Malaysian furniture products, right? We yes. are the top 10 in the world now. Exactly. So, so is West Wing carrying any Malaysian products? Yes, actually, in fact, that uh, we are sourcing a little bit from Malaysia right now. And then uh, we are very, very much interested to source more from Malaysia. Uh, unfortunately, for the last couple of years, we are able to go to Malaysia due to COVID. Right. Otherwise, that, you know, we're happy to uh, you know, we said Malaysia factories in Malaysia, in Moa, Malacca, and etc. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll follow up with you with that. <laughs> okay, back to Stephen. Mm -hmm. Okay, even though uh, 
uh, Hong Kong is a very open market, right? So I believe there are some specific requirements on FMB products to be imported to Hong Kong. Yeah. So is the requirement the same for retail, consumer, as well as food service industry? Can you share with us some okay. of the requirements? Uh, as mentioned by a previous speaker, Cindy, mm -hmm. it's already mentioned some of the requirements import to Hong Kong. But uh, there's a, actually uh, for consumer that you need to concern about the nutrition fact. Right. We, we, what we call the several plus one nutrition side, yes. you can Google this mm -hmm. the website. But for the catering side, that you are more concerned about the food hygiene, the, of course, the consumer also. But the, the, if you, your product is a ready to serve product, then you need to have a bacteria test. Right. Yeah, if you have a, like a poultry product, you need to have a, a, your export country like Malaysia, which is allow you to export. You have to get this kind of a health shirt. Yes. Otherwise, uh, the government not easy allow you to, to import. Yes, yeah. true. Yeah, just to add on that, uh, uh, a lot of the meat products you uh, Hong Kong, we have to have a G to G approval. Meaning, uh, before a company can export to Hong Kong, the government of Malaysia has to ask for approval from the Hong Kong government before any meat products can be exported to Hong Kong. So, so there will be. Uh, you can find more of this information if you are a Madrid member back in HQ, back in Malaysia, uh, that you can find some of the uh, product market studies and market alerts that my office have done. So in the, uh, um, in a way, my export uh, uh, portal, right? So, okay, um, adding on to that also, because Hong Kong is an open market also, there's a lot of competition, right? Yes. So there are a lot of uh, products from other countries coming into the market. So what does a supplier from Malaysia uh, has to do to ensure their products uh, will or can be given, uh, can gain attention from consumers and also differentiate, differentiate themselves? Okay. I would say, first of all, don't go for the cheap price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so find your own characteristic. Right. Because I found so many Malaysian products that they, they can have their authentic, their core advantage. Right. That means that their core value. Mm -hmm. Either they are Nyonya food, or they are uh, Indian food, or they are different kind of uh, food, like a uh, Hananese food. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Hokkien food. So, so you have to find your own character. And then you have to, then you have a story to tell. You find a good designer to design your packaging if you are going for consumer product. Right. If, if you're going to for the catering product, you are also have an advantage that uh, Malaysian is like a, a, not a high cost production area mm -hmm. where that can easily to get different kind of uh, food material. Right. So that is also like a, like a carbohydrate product noodles. Mm -hmm. It's also like a raw tea yes. or other ca different kind of a noodles. It's also right. in a big market in Hong Kong. All right. Yeah, in the fish bowl okay. or you are surrounded by the ocean. Yes, yeah, yes. So you have this easy access of this, uh, right. uh, not uh, expensive material. All right. yeah. So like, for instance, like you are, you are also supplying to the food service, right? Yes. So of course, there's a different kind of product uh, required by the hotels, right? Yeah. Or other establishments. Mm. Yeah. So, so what kind of product right now currently that you are supplying uh, to the food service side, the hotel side? What okay. kind of products are they interested in? Uh, actually, the, the chef is more demanding nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but uh, uh, luckily that the uh, uh, Malaysian products still have a, a lot of room to uh, penetrate into this market. Right. But they are more like a Western product they already have. Right. Okay, so the, the product from China they already have. So the only product that is not easy come from Asia is of Malaysia. Okay. So so we, we import a lot of product like a, a frozen calamansi, mm -hmm. which is yes. solve the, the freshness of the uh, Paris food product. Mm -hmm. We also import like a Hananese bread. We also import uh, like a Ibo Tao Gay. Yes. Yeah, so this kind of thing is like a very unique in Malaysia. You need to find the um, the core value and then bring this story to the local. Because if you are popular in Malaysia, there's a no difference that uh, you can't be popular here. Yes. So the, the, the chef is more uh, what demanding. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the, uh, what, uh, the purchasing department want the low price. Uh, yes. But uh, if your product is uh, authentic, it's a good taste, yeah. then you have a story to tell, nice packaging, then I don't see there's a no opportunity that you can easily to, to come to Hong Kong. Mm, yes, yeah, it's yes. a good, good platform to, okay. to, to 
uh, show off. All right, good to know that. And of course, you bring a lot of halal products also to yeah. Hong Kong. So for your for everyone's information, you know, a lot of the uh, establishment here are looking for halal products as well, yes. right? Mm -hmm. For instance, like uh, you know, there's the theme park. Yeah. They are they are uh, because they have halal restaurants as well, right? So these are the establishment that are looking for halal products yeah, as well. Yeah, right? actually, that is a requirement by the government that the, our theme park, Disneyland and Osho Park, is mm -hmm. also required this uh, kind of a halal product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. a must. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's also in the region, not many people, especially from China, you don't find uh, uh, easily Muslim. to find a Muslim mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. And then for European product with halal, you're also expensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, Thailand, you don't find too much halal product. Mm -hmm. So Malaysia, it seems to be compared with Singapore, more right. price of one thing. Right, yes. Yeah. Okay. So ju just to add also, the Malaysian chef also are very in demand now in Hong Kong and Macau. Yeah. So because of that also, there's a lot more Malaysian products promotion here, Malaysian food promotion here in, in Hong Kong. So it's good to see that, right? Uh, to have more Malaysian foods available. At least good for me, especially. I haven't been back for two years. Yeah. So it's easier for us Malaysian to, to get more Malaysian food, authentic Malaysian yeah. food. All right, back to Calvin. All right, so if a company in Malaysia uh, within the product categories, uh, they are supplying the product product categories within what you're looking for. So um, if they're interested to supply to Westping or other sourcing companies, uh, what would be the criteria that you look for in, in for, for them to fulfill? Hmm. Good question. So uh, in terms of uh, from a Western perspective, from a Europe perspective, hmm. number one, the suppliers that we're looking for is that they need to have a social compliance audit. Uh, follow the standard, for example, like DSCI, SMITA, ZX, SA8000. This is to ensure the manufacturers follow appropriate local laws, provide necessary healthcare, food, pay legal wages, and etc. So this is the T number one. Then on top of that, in terms of uh, product quality, good quality control system, and then and another point right now in Europe is going to more and more into uh, sustainability. Mm -hmm. We're looking for product that is sustainable, legally harvest product, legally harvest wood. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say, for example, cotton, we're looking for BCI, wood, we're looking for FSC. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, we are also keen into develop uh, more and more uh, social environmental awareness with the suppliers as well. Right. And then last but not least, uh, chemical testing for Europe yeah. Union is super important. For example, the, the lacquer, the wood substance, the plastic must fulfill the uh, Europe reach standard, RSL restricted substance list standards. So all those are super important, right. but I'm very confident that man, uh, Malaysian manufacturers can meet that because of, you just need to invest into the testing, get the right materials, uh, do the proper social audits, right. and then you should be able to do business with sourcing company like us or any European country. Right. So usually when you source for a product, the process will take a longer time. Like it's not like Sifan is basically you're looking at the product, then you can straight away import, right? But for a sourcing office, it's a different in a way process, right? So it, there'll be some auditing as well involved in the process, right? So can you you can tell us like a, a step by step approach of how let's say a Malaysian company wants to supply to you mm. before they can be a certified supplier. Mm -hmm. So so apart from meeting all the requirements needed by the various countries and uh, regions, mm -hmm. so you yourself have to do certain, uh, in a way, auditing, right? Correct, mm -hmm. correct. So well said, um, it can, the process can take from one month to up to six months, depending on how well equipped the manufacturers is. Okay. Because uh, number one, we have to do the social audits, we have right. to do the factory audits to ensure quality is meeting, uh, meeting the standards. Mm -hmm. And then on product level itself, we will also have to do a certain type of testing and send it to the testing lab to make sure it follows a certain EN standard, mm -hmm. EIN standard. So the whole process, it can take from one month up to six months. Mm -hmm. However, the certain things that uh, manufacturers can speed up in they are currently familiar with a EU standards mm -hmm. or they already redo some of those standards and then they can provide those certificates to a company like us. They say, okay, hey, West Wing, we have this already audited. Uh, we have this product testing. We have this type of certificate. Those can speed up. It will right. speed up. And then companies will accept and review that, ah, this is pretty reliable. Okay. And then we can audit. 
Now, if, during the audit, if we found that certain things that look for improvement, then we'll work with manufacturers to create what we call CAP, corrective action plan, and then mm -hmm. work with the manufacturers, ah, can we improve this into a certain uh, aspect, then give us the timeline, and then we can work with that as well. Mm -hmm. So I think with some of the pre-auditing, with some certificates done in advance, it can speed up the onboarding process. Right. So in, in summary, if if a company interested to supply to a sourcing company, it can actually improve their own process as well, right? Yes. Because all these regulations that are needed, sustainability and other reg Correct. regulations, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. So they can approach a company, a sourcing company like us and say, for example, here's sell a factory profile. Yeah. We have been audited with BSDI, uh, valid in this type of certificate. We source FSC wood or we use uh, uh, BSCI cotton, GRS cotton, and this is our certificate. Right. And then we also have our own design capability, and that can help to speed up the process too. Right. So companies out there take note of the requirements needed by a sourcing office such as H, uh, uh, W labels. Right. So, okay, as everyone know, uh, the pandemic has created a, uh, quite a major setback, right, in, in for companies, especially those that are doing uh, international trade, right? Mm -hmm. So, Stefan, with the pandemic, uh, many have reported um, difficulties in logistics mm -hmm. worldwide, such as, you know, inability of containers, escalating mm -hmm. freight charges, yeah, and others. So, have you faced this too in uh, between mm -hmm. your import? Uh, Malaysia to Hong Kong? Okay, so we have um, on the positive side of that mm -hmm. because the, the you see the greater China area, right. all the empty container coming back to right. this area, which means that uh, we don't uh, anticipate much increase on the freight charge, okay. maybe probably 10%, less mm -hmm. than 10%. Right. So uh, we also take the uh, air freight by cargo freight, so we don't have any major problem on that. Right. But maybe I'm sure that the Kelton will face more problem mm -hmm. on is empty container bed and then mm. move out. They not easy to get a container, right? Yes. yes, yeah, yes. For, them. Yeah. Yeah. for us, no, not a problem. No problem. Yeah. Okay, good to know that. Yeah. So what about you? So uh, in two ends. So the challenges side, what what Stephen said is is correct. Mm. And then uh, but I will say I will share the positive side first. Okay. So from the selling perspective, an e-commerce company in the EU, mm -hmm. we our business grew super well. Okay. Uh, year on year growth has doubled uh, about fifty percent. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really uh, good in, the, in terms of business. People right. staying at home, they want to make their home more cozy, they right. buy more furniture, spending their investment in furniture, right. nice and decoration and etc. Mm -hmm. uh, indirectly, that created a lot of demands, right. a lot of more and more product. So um, that is the one that come to our site in this type of water. Okay. Uh, we have to deal with the production capacity from our supplier. And that's why we're constantly looking for good supplier that good capacity mm -hmm. in the region in mainland China or in Southeast Asia. Right. And then because of due to high demand, that has caused a lot of uh, logistical challenges right. because of uh, um, port issues in Europe as well in uh, US. Right. Lots of empty containers and vessels are not able to come back to Asia. Right. And that caused a lot of uh, continuity issue. Mm -hmm. We couldn't get as good enough and fast enough uh, 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 continue to fill up our goods yeah. to export back to uh, Europe. Wow, uh, right, okay. Well, I'm one of those customers during this pandemic who have increased their purchases. <laughs> 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 All right, okay. Uh, Kevin, being a foreign company with businesses in many countries and sourcing from other countries outside of EU, so um, in a way, uh, how does your sourcing has been affected, right? Especially, like you said, the pandemic, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, because you source from China, Southeast Asia, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, difficulties or even, you know, that if, if there are none, if you face anything that may uh, impede your, your, the process of how you source from those countries? Yes, uh, the pandemic has actually has caused us the biggest challenge is to meet with the business partner right. face to face. Because uh, we believe in the uh, relationship building, mm -hmm. to meet with uh, manufacturers, with the business partners, to have the necessary uh, business uh, development discussion in person. Mm -hmm. On top of that, it's also uh, reviewing product, right. visiting the factories in person from our HQ, visiting us, vice versa. Mm -hmm. So those in personal interactions is actually uh, causing some kind of challenges. Right. Now, 
Of course, we try to mitigate that by using technologies. Uh, luckily, we have lots of Zoom calls, yeah. we have lots of Teams calls, uh, WeChat calls, WeChat videos, WhatsApp video, anything you can think of right now, we are using it as okay. we speak. We are doing the webinar yes. too. Uh, so I think that we can mitigate that, some right. of that, uh, with the right technology. So when we review the samples, so actually we have my colleagues in mainland China, they're doing like a sample review with a GoPro mm -hmm. and then explaining with the product with our buyer in Munich and then also doing certain uh, testing as well. Right. So those can be done. Okay. I think that by using technology, those can be can be done. Yeah, so a lot of tech, I mean, using the right technology can, yes. can in a way reduce. You need to get that issue. Yes. Um, if you get that, we can still do, keep the business yes. going. Uh -huh. And then I really look forward that one day we can meet the business partner as well as our colleagues from HQ mm -hmm. in, in person. But I think for now, for product and business, it's still doable with technology. All right, great to know that. So as a closing, all right, mm -hmm. for the session, uh, how do you see, Stephen, how do you see... Uh, the future of, of uh, the products that you plan to import? Would there be any changes of with the current products that you are taking in or you are looking at a more uh, specific niche product or any broader? Uh, it's our company type? that uh, not only concentrate now in the Malaysian uh, style restaurant, right. but we are more on the go to the, even we have a, a Taiwanese customer, yeah. a Taiwan restaurant yeah. here, and then Thailand, and also the local uh, uh, Guangdong yes. food restaurant yes. also buying from us. Mm -hmm. So so that means uh, the product not only, you see uh, there's a Guangdong uh, food yes. in Malaysia. Yes. So one of there is a, we can also penetrate. So mm -hmm. we see there is a still maybe big room for us to uh, penetrate into the uh, food f and uh, sector. Mm -hmm. And in addition, I want to highlight that the uh, uh, Malaysian food has a sound reputation among the Hong Kong that uh, in the past decade that uh, we don't find any bad uh, news right. about the, the food uh, uh, safety issue right. yeah, from Malaysia, okay. uh, that the product from the but where you can see many uh, bad news from other countries, mm -hmm. uh, the, the food contamination, contamination or something. All right, yeah, right. But Malaysia is a sound reputation. Okay, yeah. right. good to know that. So uh, how about you, uh, Calvin, in the in a sense that, you know, like you said, you know, generally people would go to China to source for more products, right? But now ASEAN also has a lot more, in a way, diverse uh, manufacturers of, of the consumer products that you're looking for, right? So how do you see that in the future in terms of, would it be more the source sourcing from Southeast Asia or any other markets, for instance? Uh, so we always believe uh, China plus one, and then yeah. I think Southeast Asia, ASEAN, Malaysia, Vietnam certainly is uh, one of the core countries that we will continue to develop. Mm -hmm. And it also from our perspective as a buyer, we also would like to diversify. Right. And then but that's always that, you know, uh, not keeping too much cake in one basket. Right. But I think that the uh, Southeast Asia has a really, really good uh, materials that we love to uh, leverage. Mm -hmm. And then also the quality of the product and logistics challenges that we can try to mitigate things instead of from one particular core country. Right. So for us, uh, diversify is also a good way for us to uh, make our product range okay. more interesting mm -hmm. than from one this one country. All right, great to know. So hopefully both of you can consider Malaysian products and look for me, okay? Well, that's, that's <laughs> all right, so that's all for us. So thank you, our honorary Malaysian, thank Stephen, and our Penang boy, actually, uh, Calvin, so for joining us at the panel discussion today. Okay, back to you, Casey. Okay, thank you, Ez. Thank you very much for hosting such an excellent discussion. Uh, thank you also, Stephen and Calvin, for sharing your uh, valuable uh, insights and experience. I think what we can take away from this is there is a huge amount of potential uh, in Hong Kong and through Hong Kong. Um, we're only touching the tip of the iceberg, uh, the market potential for Malaysian products and, uh, and goods um, is, is absolutely uh, m m uh, huge, really, really huge. Lots of hungry mouths here yearning to, to, to dig into um, Malaysian food. Actually, speaking of Penang, I made a uh, pilgrimage to Penang a few years ago for durian. So thank you, Angelica, for reminding me of that. Um, uh, coming up next is uh, our last but not least uh, speaker. 
Uh, Zen is um, <clears throat> Zen is a is one of the vice chairman of the Malaysian Chamber here in Hong Kong. Um, Zen has uh, is actually the one who instigated the whole thing, and uh, I must thank you uh, for 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 initiating all this. Uh, in his personal capa professional capacity, Zen is responsible for building and managing Concentrix's businesses and clients in Greater China and Southeast Asia region. Concentrix um, is one of the world's largest customer experience solutions company with 250,000 employees globally. So um, over to you, Zen, for the closing. Thank you very much, Casey. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't know about you, but I have certainly learned a lot from the sessions from all the experts, from uh, the counselors um, and, and the Invest Hong Kongs uh, and our experts in Hong Kong. So. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining. I hope you have learned a thing or two, just like me. And I'd like to thank the Council of Malaysia for um, helping us to set this up. He's and uh, our Council General uh, from Invest Hong Kong. Obviously, we have Casey, we have Cindy, we have Angelica. So now I know who to get to for all my all my necessary expertise um, within within the FMM. Thank you so much for Mr. Sun and and his team uh, for setting this up for us. Uh, this, this session is important. The economy is opening.